How could stand-up comedy help you develop your confidence and presentation skills? Also, how important is what you wear to the way you perform, both in interviews and in day-to-day -day roles? Let's find out. Welcome to Half Hour Mentor. My name is Ian Cleverdon and welcome to the eighth episode of the series. We are well into the second half of the first series now and preparation is already being made for the recording of series two. If there are any topics that you'd like me to cover in the future, please let me know by contacting me via the various social media channels relating to this series or by emailing me at the address found in the show notes. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Brendan Riley to the podcast. Bren is a professional stand-up comedian, compare and director of Big Comedy UK, which is responsible for running successful comedy festivals in the northwest of England. In his role as professional comedian, he's toured with the likes of Jason Manford and has entertained our troops in Afghanistan. Whilst it may initially seem unusual to consider how stand-up comedy could help develop business skills, you'll soon realise from the interview that many of the skills needed for stand-up translate to boost both personal and professional development. So let's hear from Bren. Brenda Riley, welcome to Half Hour Mentor. Let's go back to your teenage years then. Okay, if you can remember that far back. <laughs> <laughs> what was your first job or what was the first thing you wanted to do when you were at school? Okay, so when I was at school, I, I was massive. School and I didn't get on. School and I did not get on. I, um, I used to bore me to death. So my interests when I was right through my childhood, right up to even my early 20s and still now, were military, military matters, military history, the mechanics of the Second World War especially. So I always envisaged I would join the army or the RAF or do something. Um, I suppose what put me off a little bit is I joined the cadets when I was a teenager and the discipline side of stuff was not so much that I was a anti, um, anti-discipline, it was more the rank and I saw a bit of bullying and I went, ooh, don't like that, don't like that. So that put me off a tiny bit. That was a cadet with the, the, the ATC, which was fantastic, fantastic thing. But I just saw a little bit of it and went, oh, that doesn't sit well with me. Um, so I still, I suppose when I left school, I still thought I would join the army or join the RAF. I still was really, really keen to do something like that. And then I suppose because I left school with no qualifications, it narrowed down my options of what I could become in the RAF or the um, um, especially and regarding whether I would learn a trade or whatever I wanted to do and I suppose I was naive I was quite naive um, so when I went for a few interviews and stuff they said well you can join the RAF regiment with what qualifications you've got which were next to nothing mm. and it kind of wasn't for me it wasn't for me and then so I became um, first ever job was I was at worked in a timber yard so I left school uh, I left school at 12 o'clock when I was, I think it was 16, I think you left school then. I think I'm sure I'm almost certain it was 16. It was 1983, so that would be, I'd be 16, but not long-term 16, um, because it was probably May 1983, and I left school in the middle of a recession, and this is something that's always stayed with me, and that this is in my nature and Gino. Uh, the day I left school, left school at 12 o'clock, and by four o'clock that afternoon, middle of recession, I'd got a job. And I literally didn't even, I didn't even have a bike. We weren't, we lived in a place called Formby, which is very middle class, but we were probably the poor end of the families, big family, big, you know, um, a Catholic family, typical six kids. And we didn't have much. And I didn't even have a bicycle to ride over. And I rode from where, where my mum and dad lived over to um, Formby Industrial Estate. And I just knocked on every door, garage, every, every didn't even have a clue. And probably the naivety was a good thing, really. <laughs> and um, I just said, have you got a job? A bit like a Yossi Hughes in the black stuff. <laughs> have you got a job? And it was a case of those days were really, really bad in this area in the Northwest. They really were like the uh, boys from the black stuff. And I said, have you got a job? Have you got a job? Have you got a job? And I went to a place called Formby Timber and the boss there, Alistair, um, told me years on the only reason he gave me the job is because you walked in and asked for a job and he liked that wow. so so literally he admired that this little lad it must have looked like a baby because I only could now even when I was 18 I got knocked back from pubs because I look young I still look relatively young for me years now um, but the reality is this little boy walked in and said can I have a job and he said yeah okay 
gave me a job and then I worked there for a few weeks and then literally I was on that the one of those YTS schemes which were dreadful but gave me a start for a year so I was there for a year and then I basically made friends with guys across the way on the industrial estate made friends with people and then I became a mechanic right. then I was more interested it was boring timber yard for all for all you know the good it was it was a job but it was incredibly boring and I wanted something more to stimulate me so being a mechanic was a bit more challenging technical. brilliant it was yeah. like I remember getting the job thinking wow I'm actually going to be a mechanic that shows you where I was in my, you know, I suppose my in- level of intelligence or the level of where I was as a human being. That I, I was kind of bragging that I was going to be a mechanic. Right. So you, yeah. But how did you get into comedy then? Okay. So always, always since I was a kid, classic one of the younger in the family. Um, I've always had a good memory for jokes. So I always watched, um, even in school, and I've been told this a thousand times by everyone who I meet, old school friends, we knew you were going to be a comedian, we knew you were going to be a comedian, storyteller. So I would watch these shows of the day, which were uh, the comedians recite, the jo- literally watch them, memorise them straight away. And what I thought was what everyone did is made the jokes better. So I made them a bit, tighten them up, did this, did a bit of writing on them. But I didn't do that in any way on paper. I just thought, yeah, it was better if it was a, an ice cream van, not a sweet shop or something to make them embellish the joke. So I would then um, tell, happily tell the jokes in the playground and at school, high school. And people used to walk up to me and they'd say, Riley, they call your school thing. Mm-hmm. Riley, tell us a joke. And I'd go, okay, what about? And they'd say, I don't know, fire engine. And, say, and I'd, I'd probably nail a couple of jokes on. I'd be like the Bob Monkhouse thing. <laughs> where he used to be able to tell a joke on any subject. For me, it was just completely natural to memorise and, and show off telling telling jokes. You know, so it was natural. So I always told jokes. Going back to when I was 10, I actually, I was an altar boy, um, again, Catholic family and all that, I was an altar boy. And Tom, Tom O'Connor was in a church in form because his mum and dad lived here. And I left, I must have been 10 or 11. I wasn't, a, wasn't younger than that because, of course, I went on my own. I went and knocked on his door and found his house. Again, some drive there for a kid. I don't know, look back now and think, flipping Ecker. Um, I decided I'm going to go and find out and speak to that Tom O'Connor guy off the television. And Tom so O'Connor I, was huge in the 70s. Oh, Tom was O'Connor was massive. He was massive, but his mum and daddy bought, he was a nice guy, Tom O'Connor. He bought the mum and dad a house in where we live, which is a nice area in Formby. And I basically went on to it again, went on to this housing estate. Ironically, I bought a house years later on that same estate. My first house was on that estate. It was probably about, you know, half a mile from the church. And I, on my own, knocked on a house and said, Tom, uh, Tom O'Connell, I know, I know he doesn't live here, but does he live near? And neighbours literally fired me down the road to his house. So I didn't know where he lived. <laughs> and I just knocked on his door. And again, this comes back to some something deep down. Obviously, I had confidence somewhere to be able to go. I'm just going to go and do that. And I knocked on the door. An old, nice old man came to the door and I said, this is Tom O'Connor's house. And he says, well, it's my house, but he's my son. I said, can I speak to him? And sure enough, Tom O'Connor in his slippers was waiting for his roast dinner to get cooked, <laughs> came to the door. And his advice was brilliant. He said, you, you should watch comedy. You should, any chance you get, which I would tell anyone, any chance you get to go on stage in school or anything, or a t- storytelling, do that. And... Um, he said, watch TV comedy and watch the way jokes are formulated. Watch Terry and Junie cited as a show. I didn't like it. I don't like it. No, it's not for me, that kind of thing. But he said, Terry and Junie, watch that show and you'll get an idea of how jokes are formulated and where the jokes come from and stuff, which was lovely about it. Yeah. And I met him, ironically, years on. Um, I interviewed him when I was working for Radio Merseyside on the comedy festival and I told him the story and he didn't remember me. And you'd think, <laughs> you'd think he would, wouldn't you really? I'm not, not, not for my ego. There can't be that many people knock who on knock the door, on the door say, little lad how'd you says, how do you become a comedian? Yeah. <laughs> and sadly, they go, they, I, I had obviously this drive to do something, which is still now the way I am. But usually, and it's something I've learned to get used to, usually I don't worry too much about how to get there in a way. I just try and go nearer, get nearer and get nearer and sort it out. And I'll know it'll come together. 
because I remember him saying to me, and this shows how my naivety, said, oh, you just need to do this and that. And I was thinking, oh, there's no school you can go to to learn how to be a comedian, as if there was some kind of college or school, you know? Yeah. Well, we'll come on to that in a bit, because I know yeah. you do run some sessions to yeah, help yeah, business cool. people and so on. But can I just ask you about this comedy and this memorising thing? Because, I mean, I, you know, I've seen you live. You, you just, you pick up, obviously, you'll just pick up on certain things going in the audience, but you've also got that memory and that bank of jokes. How do you recall that? What do you do in your practice? Because it's mirrors to presentation skills and somebody stands up and does a presentation, totally. you know, and they go, oh, you know, there's that freezing. How right. do you deal right. with the that? The first thing you do, you've got to find what works for you. And that's the thing that's individual. There is no one way. There is no one fix to um, how you memorize things. For me, it's completely pictures, photographs in my mind. It's photographs in my mind. It's pictures. I almost say to people when I'm actually on stage, if I say I'm on holiday and I'm acting at a scene on stage, every part of my body is in that zone, is in that place, is on that, is in that resort, is by the swimming pool with the kids are messing in the pool, if I'm telling a story. But how do you translate those pictures? How do you prepare for them and then translate them in order? When yeah, you... okay, so, so there's a sequence to a routine and it's key. I'll give an example. The other night, I hadn't done a joke for, I think, this routine for maybe three or four years due to COVID, because I'd not done as much stand-up through COVID. We were doing different types of shows and stuff. And all I did is, the, 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 the way I teach it in the courses and the way I teach um, myself and it, from me doesn't work for everyone. Some people like words and writing it out is turns in the road. And it's, it's a simple way, a technique that I remember it in the right order and don't miss a turn in the road. And the example I give, the analogy is, if I said to you, how do you drive from work to home? You wouldn't tell me every single detail. The same with a speech or a presentation. You don't need to remember all the details. Most of it you know anyway and back to front and you can bore everyone to death with those details. But what you need is a basic structure, which is how to get home. And how to get home is, down to the end of the road first, or you turn right. Okay. You don't need to tell me about the curbstones, the police station, the, the, it's not as important, just turn, turn right. And then and do you picture a joke on so that I corner? So I picture it, so I, so what I do, no, I don't use that in a way, it's, it's kind of an analogy. I'll go, the joke is, so this routine that I'd written was um, about two gangs, it's about the difference between Cockneys and Scouts, this is the routine, and it's about this football, this train going to a football match, and there's three Cockneys and three Scousers, and it, it transpires that they, they're trying to, they're trying to um, get on the train without pain, basically, and the Cockneys are watching and learning, and, and street, well, about being streetwise. That doesn't matter, but what I did is I remember programming my brain before I went on, and I went, right, they're on the train, they're this, and I'm picturing them on the train, sitting there in the carriage. So I use pictures. It's almost like photographs. Right. So I'll, so I'll, the joke in my head is, is I'm on the train. They're there. The three of them are there. The three scouts are there. They're giving each other stick. Got that the next bit. Then the, tri the guy comes in. They've got to go and hide in the toilet. Then he comes through and he asks the cockneys for the tickets. Then he goes and gets their ticket. Then they're on the match for, happens. Then I come back. And it's almost like it's pictures. It's like watching a television show. Right. And it worked that, but that works for me. And you've got two things going on then. You see, you've got that visualization of almost the story, but that triggers off the joke. And exactly. The... So what it okay. is, my, I know the details, and and because I've done, the, I've done it enough. So I trust myself that I don't need to learn exactly what's happening. All I know is there's turns in the road, and the turns on the road are. Three Cockneys, three Scousers, it's got to be the same. It's got mm. the, That can't fail in the, in the routine. And the same with a story or a presentation. You need to get certain certain facts 100% right. Yeah. The rest don't really matter. You can waffle, yeah? And then they're on a train. They're giving each other some stick. That's got to be put in there mm -hmm. for later on. Ticket guys got to do these. So it's the, in the joke to make the joke work and the routine work. Like it would if I was telling you about something or presenting to you about something. I have to give you the vital information to make the joke work. Mm. Now, jokes are different than a, if I was telling you about a Xerox copier. Mm. But, the, but there's vital information. If you want to get that, sell that Xerox copier that you've identified with that customer, 
why you want to sell him it and why it would be good news for him to buy it off you. Hmm. You have to get, make sure that is nailed down yes. and you can go round the houses about everything else about it. But there's a, there are probably about five things why he needs the brand new Xerox and you've got to convince him that that's a good idea for his business to buy the new thing. And that's selling to the benefits to that person rather than the features of the product, isn't it? Which is a classic selling technique anyway. Absolutely. There's no point telling someone how good this copier is. You've got to tell them, and this is different again, this is this is marketing, isn't it? You've got to tell them why they need that thing and why that's better than the old one mm. and how much better it is for their business. Of course you do. Mm. It's always got to be empathy with your audience, that is. And that's what a stand-up comedian does. Mm. I've got to give them the jokes they want to hear. Yeah. There's no point me going on about something that's of non-interest to them. So identifying what's important with the presentation and... We'll get back to that in a minute. Well, let, but, let, let's but, talk about well, that now. Because okay, you know, on. one of the other aspects that you do, because you're the director of the Southport and Chester Comedy Festivals, yeah. the crucial part of your job is gaining sponsorship, which is effectively totally. selling you, totally. selling what you're doing. So yeah. how do you go about that Xerox copy of okay, this Comedy is an Festival? Import, this is an important journey. So basically, I've done stand-up comedy for 20-odd years. The Southport Comedy Festival was cancelled in 2010 by the council because of cutbacks, the austerity measures following 2008 Financial crash. Financial crisis. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So they cut back, cut back, cut back. They, they cancel the festival. And um, it was by chance, on, it started by chance, is that the theatre had booked a few big names. And normally the council would wrap a comedy festival around these these names that Southport Theatre um, would book. I was kind of working on the festival with some of the tourism team preceding three years preceding me taking it over and basically they didn't know anything about comedy you had a small group of staff who would do a jazz festival one week a comedy festival the other next week a food festival the other week a music festival the other week the firework musical fireworks will be the other week these events would run through and the staff to be fair to them were dead sound but they didn't know anything about they would bring individuals in to help them coordinate the comedy festival, the jazz festival. So basically, I got earmarked that I might be the person to run the take the comedy festival on, and I'd never done anything like this. I'd never done anything with sponsorship, so I was very naive. And I remember turning up, which was quite clear to me, I remember turning up to meet the, the programmer at Southport Theatre, and I knocked at the door and she said, what do you want? And I was there in the Berghaus coat, trainees a pair of jeans and looked like a scruff <laughs> it was winter and a and bob lat on and I, I remember looking like a scruff and feeling like a scruff because you could see that she's like are you the person i've been told could run the comedy festival yeah first and, impressions and I, it really sticks doesn't massive, it massive yeah. ma and it's shallow as hell yeah. but massive massive and, and certain businesses like apple it's all about no suits now and all that stuff but I think it's so important to present yourself, which is something I learned quickly. And then basically, anyway, I was the guy to do it. You know, we had a chat and we had a laugh and it was all fine and I got on with, with her really well. And she said, okay. And I said, well, how could I do this? How could I run? What do I need? Again, what, a bit like a stand-up routine. What do I need to make this festival work? And I needed a brochure. So I needed a couple of grand straight away for a decent brochure. And then I realised, I looked at the weaknesses which is something I do when I teach comedy. I look at someone's weaknesses before I try, and, and that's what we work on and identify, which we'll talk about in a minute as well. Mm. And I looked up, it didn't have a website, didn't have an identity, didn't have anything that was kind of marketable, you know, which was kind of like the comedy festival. It was called the Southport Comedy Week and it was eight days long. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> it's a joke in itself, you know. So I said, right, I need sponsors. Did have contacts at the local newspaper with Midweek Visitor, with Echo Group, Trinity News, who were brilliant. They loved what I was going to do. I was going to stand up in the middle of a recession and I was going to stand up and save a comedy festival. And I ended up getting on Northwest Tonight News and because of it. Cause it's a good story, it's isn't BBC, it? It's local. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So I got on the news. This guy stands up for stand-up, you know, was the headline, you know. And, <laughs> and um, so that helped me a little bit. I was already in with radio because I'd done radio. I, um, radio um, City backed me the first year, which was great at least as a sponsor media partner, which helped me. And then really, then it was the, the big leap into corporate sponsorship. How does, how do I, the first thing I did is smart myself up. Right. Shirt, shoes, trousers. It's so shallow, but obvious as well to mm. anyone in business. The people I was speaking to, 
There's a guy who's a financial advisor, a guy called Dave Barron, who's in Southport, was brilliant with me, took me under his wing, introduced me to estate agents, this, that, and the other. But by then, I ditched the jeans and the trainees straight away. Mm. So I looked the part. But that's a bit like interviews. If you're going exactly for an interview, the isn't same. it? You know, it's, it's not just saying, I need to have a suit on or whatever, but thinking, what does the company expect? And they might not tell you, but you just got to try and work that out. Do you know in the what, research? What I found out if I was the smart, I used to have a pair, pair of pants. This sounds really cynical. Call me money pants, and they were these <laughs> pair of trousers that were very drain pipey, very stylish, with a pair of Italian leather shoes. I spent some money on my gear, mm. and I looked the part. It's probably the smartest I've ever been in my life <laughs> because I felt not just because of trying to impress um, a, um, a future sponsor, but it actually made me feel better that I was the smartest person in the room. I made sure me everything was ironed. I looked like, you know, military down the seams, the whole shebang. Yeah. And you know what? This is something that harks back to performance, harks back to presentation. It's important to wear what you're comfortable in, but you're not going to be comfortable if you've got a pair of jeans on and it's a black tie dinner do. Mm. Now, not everyone likes the penguin suits and dinner do's and all that stuff. Subsequently, I do do those shows now and present them and do award ceremonies. It's not for me... But I make sure that my dinner suit is my dinner suit that I wear is it fits me perfectly, yeah. and it's not big money. I think I got might have got it from Next or somewhere wherever I got it yeah. from it was one hundred and fifty quid. But I'm telling you, it looks like a five hundred pound suit, and it's getting and that first because impression it feels that it, in no, that. but it feels good to be in it for you, which again is down to you going for a job interview or presenting something to a client or trying to sell Xerox machines. <laughs> you should look the part. But again, it's important to identify, like a comedy routine, what does the audience want? Hmm. What do they, what, what's expected of me? And an important thing again is what do I want? Hmm. What do I want from this meeting? Whether it's selling a Xerox, whether it's being a stand-up comedian, I want them to laugh, hmm. which of course is the obvious. I want them to like me which is obvious, job interview. What do you want? How much do you want the job? And we will talk about this in a second, about preparation. If you mm. want to hark on with it, we can do that now, if you jump on now, because the way your brain works sometimes, I'll bounce from one thing to the next, be like Billy Connolly. You've, you've got to. the pictures there. You've yeah, got, you've yeah. got another I'm turn right, in the road. I'm all right. But, <laughs> but it's, if, if, we, if, if, you know, the whole point of this, this um, the podcast is about how my skills that I've learned through stand-up comedy and subsequently business apply then to a person who hasn't done this before who wants to learn a new skill wants to learn something mm. so clothing is important and i say it to comedian we say to me what in the comedy workshops what shall i wear and i'll go well what are you comfy in what are you comfy in but put a shirt on mm. make, make an effort just jump it up that level yeah make yeah. it make me look smart feel smart look smart feel smart mm. oh god i'm trying to tell you a story there was a, an american footballer who was interviewed um and i'm gonna probably get this all back to front but they eat this guy big american football gigantic of a man was known for his suits and he was obviously a, a probably well known i don't know who it was but he's obviously very well known we're talking premier league level you know american football and he was interviewed and he said what is it with the clothes and an interview what about the clothes and he says when i when i dress good i feel good <laughs> and when i feel good i play good and when i play good they pay good. <laughs> it's, a, it's a classic. It's a classic. And it does, when you feel good, you perform better. You, you feel good. I mean, there's a certain psychology as well about being in a uniform. When you're in your uniform, your business uniform, you have a business. And it's weird how it takes over you. I used to have a guy called, well, still have gig shirts. And what they are is, they're not like Hawaiian shirts, but they're a little bit more flamboyant than you go down the pub in. Mm. Let's turn to your workshops then. So you okay. run some comedy workshops for businesses, you do them for charity as well and the like. So you're taking people who have no knowledge of stand-up and in some cases they're wanting to learn how to be present, present themselves better, work in teams better. What are the lessons that you've learned and that you can put across in those sessions okay okay so there's there's usually with my comedy workshops there's two clear types of people that do it there's um there's the people who want to be stand-up comedians and they have an agenda and I, and I make sure on week one i ask people what they want from the course what do you want from the course but i reckon two-thirds of the people even the ones on the comedy course are not really there to be comedians if not more they're there to improve public speaking skills and that's a big one for them um i know people who've done the the, the, the format of the course is 
Usually it's six weeks with a performance at the end. And I normally only take 10 people, around 10 people, 12, eight, that kind of number. And the reason why I, I keep it to those numbers is quite simply because the work, each workshop's normally two or three hours long. Uh, it's six weeks long and I couldn't really give each person enough time uh, individually to develop them if it was a bigger group. I, 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 mm. I mean, I suppose I could put together something for a group of 70, 80 people and I could talk about the skills. But really, the thing, the big thing I've learned from teaching the comedy courses um, regarding public speaking is, is to identify with the individual's weaknesses. That I mentioned it before. It's it's so that's why having a small group works for me because it's invariably every single group I've ever taught have been completely different for the next one. Now, there's some rules apply. Some rules apply. Um, I.e., I can't make someone funny. I can't make them funny. I can make them funnier. And how long do they have to do in sort of a routine? Did it help? Five, five, ten minutes. Okay. Five, ten minutes at the end. Which doesn't I seem a lot, but when it's your own stuff. Yeah, it's... And, and, and again, if, it was, if we were talking about te- talk ten minutes about Xerox, as you could probably talk for two hours if, you were a, if that was your business. Yeah. You'd just to use that as, a, as an example or whatever it is. Um, but to make an audience laugh for five to ten minutes for a beginner feels like ten hours. Mm. And invariably, the more they do it, the more I teach, the more I train them. By the end, five to ten minutes flies by. But at the start, even a minute seems like the day in the there on in front of the group. Um, it's very performance heavy, and inevitably, as I teach ten individuals with all individual weaknesses and strengths. It's different than the time before. Some things are constant. The big the big one, I would say, the big lesson with stand-up performance and any presentation is preparation. It's preparation, 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 preparation. Bore yourself to death. Know your subject. Know your subject. Know your subject. Know your subject. So that's getting, turning the road, turning the road. It's, it's, it's knowing, it's knowing the individual, it's knowing your subject. And I think a lot of people get nervous with public speaking because they're not, they don't know what they're going to say. Mm. So, so as soon as you know what you, you know what you're going to say, you know what you want to say, you prepare for what you're trying to achieve, then it becomes quite easy then because in, in, inevitably you're just telling a story. Well, basically, the, what you're saying there is exactly the same approach you should take for a presentation. It's 100%. That's exactly so right. That's no, what that's, what, that's what your point is. That's the point. The point is, if I, you said to me, Bren, I've got a job for you. I've got this new van I want you to sell to this, uh, this, this company that buy vans, they buy vans. Then I would go, okay, I would find out, not just because of my mechanical background, but I would say to make me a better salesman of that vehicle and to be able to present to all their sales guys or the buyers, whatever they are, whoever they are, these executives, I would have to know the, everything about that van. I would know the competition. I would know what was good about it, what was bad about it, why it's better than their old. Exactly what I've said before. Exactly, I would know all the angles and that would give me the confidence to walk out there. If you told me to do that now, now in the next hour, my bottle would go, and I'd go, oh my God, what have I done? I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know what's going on. All, all the, the insecurities have come out, which is the same with anyone with public speaking. The first thing they think is, oh my God, what am I going to do? But then prepare, prepare, prepare. I've spoken to guys, honestly, who are, who, are, who are executive level, who are quite smart, intelligent guys. And I've said to them, why do you hate public speaking? And they'll go something like, oh, I'm scared of, scared of, um, um, freezing, scared of looking, basically the scared of looking stupid, yeah, and being da- and being found out as they might think. Um, and I'll say, how much preparation goes into what we, your speech? How much preparation goes in? And most of them are that busy they don't prepare. Mm. And there you go, the failed, the failed. That's a very common away. bit of feedback. Yeah, the, yeah. they've failed. They, they have not prepared because they're too busy. So so even bullet points, bullet points. You know, I, I, people ask me about best man speeches and stuff like that. And I said, right, first thing you do is get it off the paper. Get it off the paper. And I say that there's a difference between something, the way something is written and the way something is read out. And by there's saying massive... get it off the paper, get it in your head. Exactly. Get it away from the paper. I've got one last question for you now, Bren. Then I ask all my guests this. It's knowing what you know now, what one piece of advice would you give that younger self that was perhaps a mechanic? 
I suppose I'd be harking back to something we've already spoken about is preparation, work hard at preparation, work hard, whatever you do, whatever you do, whether you work, I used to race motorbikes, work harder at preparation because when I was younger, I wasn't as confident as I am now and I'm still not an overly confident person, but the more I prepare, the more confidence I have given the situation, whether that's going on radio, talking to a sponsor, going on stage myself, or even comedy workshops, I prepare more, be aware that you have to, the more you prepare, the, the easier it is to execute whatever that task may be. Bren Riley, thank you very much. Cheers, man. If you've seen stand-up comedians perform, have you ever reflected on how much preparation, preparation and preparation goes into a routine? Bren's experience in that field is immense, and as you can see, many of those attributes can easily help us in our day-to-day performance. I particularly like the the turns-in-the-road tip for helping with presentations and memorising key points. Also, that point about thinking what to wear for each interaction was fascinating. It's made me think about how many organisations accept smart casual within the working environment. But what does that mean to you? What does it mean to them? And how can you dress in a way that will still give you that extra confidence but meets that smart casual style? Thanks go to Bren for his time and mentorship. You can learn about his business and find a link to the Southport Comedy Festival in the show notes, as well as to the series sponsor, Manchester Metropolitan University Business School. My thanks go to them for keeping the podcast series ad-free. If you've enjoyed the episode, please subscribe to the series wherever you get your pods. You can leave feedback about the episode through social media by searching for Half Hour Mentor. Thanks for joining us, and until next time, bye for now.